Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Lucas Leonard and the Word of Life cult? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and offer my analysis. Jerry Dean Irwin was born in Erie, Pennsylvania on April 22, 1957. When he was 16, he became convinced that a police informant was trying to frame him. He broke the windows out of the police informant's residence and then left the area. Jerry hitchhiked to Ohio and then made his way to Florida. He married in 1974 and the couple had two children. Jerry enlisted in the Air Force. The marriage ended a few years later. In 1984, Jerry married a woman named Tracy. The couple would go on to have a daughter named Tiffany and two sons, Joseph and Daniel. That same year, Jerry formed a cult and called it the Word of Life Christian Church in Chadwick's New York. This is about an hour east of Syracuse. In 1989, a man named Bruce Leonard started attending the Word of Life Church. Bruce was born in 1950 and grew up near Cooperstown, New York. He earned a master's degree in plant and soil science and was a teacher. Bruce married in 1973 and had a daughter named Crystal in 1979. He divorced in 1988. Bruce was introduced to the Word of Life Church and was impressed with the pastor, Jerry Irwin. Bruce joined the church and met a woman named Deborah. She had children from a prior marriage. One was named Sarah Ferguson. Bruce and Deborah married. They would have four children together, including Lucas, who was born in 1995, and Christopher, who was born in 1998. Over time, the Word of Life Church grew in size, eventually reaching 60 to 70 members. All the adult members of the church had regular jobs, and they spent their spare time working at the church for free. In addition, they donated money, which supported Jerry Irwin and his family. As the church grew, they moved a few times before ending up purchasing a three-story brick building for $175,000. The building was built as a public school in 1916. A gymnasium, which was added on in the 1970s, functioned as the church's large sanctuary. A room off of that functioned as the small sanctuary. Jerry had the church members renovate the third floor of the building, and he and his family lived there. When Jerry's daughter Tiffany was 25 years old, she was ordained as a minister in the church. By 2012, Tiffany had functionally replaced Jerry as the leader of the church. The church members wondered where Jerry was. Tiffany informed them that he suffered a stroke in May of that year. The members were not worried because Jerry made it clear he would never die. Jerry died on December 8, 2012. Some of the church members thought Jerry would be resurrected because that was the backup plan in case he died. But like most people, Jerry remained dead. His failure to resurrect meant that Tiffany had absolute control over the church. Tiffany told the church members that she had seen Jesus and spoke to him regularly. He gave her information about people and situations that she could not possibly otherwise know. Tiffany initially relaxed some of the strict policies that her father had put in place, but then she started to rule with an iron fist. The church monitored internet usage from the members, and they were not allowed to watch television. The only people who the church members could interact with were other members. They were not allowed to have any outside contact. This included their family members. Cult members were routinely pressured to donate large amounts of money and labor. No matter how much they gave, Tiffany was not satisfied. Tiffany used her brothers Joseph and Daniel to function like hired muscle. They were both over six feet tall and weighed over 250 pounds. During services, the brothers would stand with their arms crossed and not talk to anybody. Joseph had a hunting knife on his belt. As a method of manipulation, Tiffany developed what she referred to as a counseling session. It was essentially an extended interrogation where she would demand a confession from a church member. Tiffany convinced targets of the counseling sessions that God spoke to her and revealed their sins. Therefore, there was no point in them trying to hide those sins. 
the members would admit to all types of offenses, including behaviors they didn't do. Over time, Tiffany's heavy-handed tactics drove a number of members away from the Word of Life Church. This put pressure on the cult financially, as exploiting the members for money was how the cult survived. Instead of trying to be friendly, warm, and inviting, Tiffany decided to double down on her authoritarian tactics. She told the members that if they left the Word of Life Church, God would reach out and harm their family. Church members continued to leave the church despite these threats. This takes us to the timeline of the crime. On October 11, 2015, Tiffany decided to conduct a counseling session to interrogate Lucas and Christopher. This was after the main service at the church. Tiffany had been informed by the half-sister of Lucas, Sarah Ferguson, that Lucas had visited another church. He was thinking about leaving the Word of Life Church. For some time now, Tiffany had been criticizing his parents, Bruce and Deborah, for not disciplining Lucas and Christopher enough. She tried to bring shame on the couple. She told them that the devil was entering into the souls of their sons. This counseling session appeared to build on Tiffany's criticisms of Bruce and Deborah in light of the new information about Lucas stopping by another church, like now Lucas had gone too far. In addition to Tiffany and Sarah, seven other people actively participated as perpetrators against Lucas and Christopher in the counseling session. The parents of Lucas and Christopher, Bruce and Deborah, Tiffany's brothers, Joseph and Daniel, Tiffany's mother, Tracy, a church member named David Morey, and his mother, Linda. The counseling session started at around 10 p.m. Tiffany opened by accusing Lucas and Christopher of using voodoo and witchcraft to harm her. As was her typical pattern, Tiffany started adding offenses to the list. She accused Lucas and Christopher of offending against children of church members. Some of the children belonged to their half-sister, Sarah. As the outrage was building in the room, Lucas and Christopher denied all the accusations. Bruce and Deborah pressured them to confess, despite the denials, and despite the fact that the accusations were not true. Eventually, Joseph punched the teenagers in the stomach and slapped them. Initially, Bruce and Deborah did not get involved physically, but Tiffany insisted that Bruce was a bad father unless he could get his sons to repent. Tiffany was trying to save Bruce and his family from the fires of hell. Eventually, Bruce and Deborah started beating their sons with an extension cord. Over the course of the counseling session, Lucas and Christopher were beaten together and one at a time. Christopher was forced to wear headphones so he couldn't hear his brother Lucas screaming. Lucas and Christopher started confessing to the false allegations in an effort to stop the attacks. Falsely believing that her children had been harmed by Lucas and Christopher, their half-sister Sarah started beating them with an extension cord as well. Throughout the counseling session, Sarah inflicted the majority of the damage and was particularly interested in damaging their genitals. The attacks continued all night until about 8 a.m. on October 12, 2015. Just before noon, the church members realized that Lucas was dead. Bruce and a few other members drove Lucas's lifeless body to the hospital. He was pronounced dead at 12.28 p.m. His body was severely bruised from his thighs to his stomach. Staff at the hospital initially thought he had been shot. After visiting the hospital, the police made their way to the church building. They discovered that Christopher had been beaten as well. He was treated and survived. All nine church members who actively participated in the counseling session were arrested and charged with various offenses. Sarah Ferguson was convicted of manslaughter and assault and sentenced to 25 years in prison. She is eligible for parole in 2037. Tiffany Irwin pleaded guilty to manslaughter and assault. She was sentenced to 12 years in prison. She is eligible for parole in 2026. Joseph Irwin was convicted of first-degree gang assault and sentenced to eight years in prison. His brother Daniel and their mother Tracy pleaded guilty to unlawful imprisonment and were both sentenced to two years in prison. Bruce Leonard pleaded guilty to felony assault. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Deborah Leonard pleaded guilty to assault in the first and second degree. She was given five years. The two other participants, David Morey and his mother Linda, pleaded guilty to two counts of second degree assault. They received five years. At the time making this video, several of the offenders have already been released from prison. Now moving to my analysis. 
Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Long before the murder occurred, people who lived in the area were troubled by the Word of Life Church. Members rarely communicated with anyone in the neighborhood. They would set off fireworks from the roof. There was bizarre chanting. Dogs were barking frequently from inside the compound. They would see men wearing trench coats patrolling the property, even in the summer. Generally, people avoided the church building and were afraid of the cult members. Item number two, Jerry Irwin's career as a pastor was based on the idea that he spoke directly to God. He essentially considered himself to be the next best thing to a deity. If church members lost contact with Jerry, they would lose contact with God and burn in the fires of hell forever. Jerry frequently deceived people by delivering what he referred to as a prophetic word. This is some type of statement that he received from God. Bruce Leonard was deceived by one of these statements. He believed that Jerry could not have known the information except from God. Bruce thought that Jerry was the key to his salvation. Jerry frequently made predictions, like that certain people would recover from illnesses or otherwise have a positive outcome. On the rare occasions when his predictions were correct, he claimed the credit for the result. He was able to manipulate people with this primitive tactic. Item number three. For some people, the initial attraction to a cult is a pleasurable lifestyle. For example, the followers of Bhagwan Rajneesh liked the frequent drug use and sex that were incorporated into cult life. With the Word of Life cult, the conditions were terrible from the beginning. There was nothing that could be remotely interpreted as pleasurable. A few examples. The church building was disgusting. There were excessive quantities of dogs, cats, and other animals in the building. The animals were not properly cared for. The smell of urine and feces was intolerable and led to nausea and vomiting. There was rotting food all over the place, piles of dirty clothes. The children did not have beds. There was only one mattress. Some people slept on box springs. The cult members were cut off from the outside world. They had to work for the cult and donate money under the threat of their family being harmed. They were functionally blocked from pursuing personal wealth. Tiffany's message was very negative. If people didn't believe what she was saying, they would burn in hell forever. She once suggested that God hated to be around most of the church members. Just like her father, Tiffany accused members of impure and evil sexual desires and actions. The Word of Life cult was essentially a recreation of hell, like boot camp to prepare for hell. Their motto should have been something like, why wait for hell when you can have hell on earth and get twice the suffering? Tiffany suggested that she would not be going to hell, which probably improved the members' opinion of hell. Item number four, both Jerry and his daughter understood the importance of maintaining control when operating a cult. The children went to the church school, not outside schools. Marriages were arranged by the cult leaders. The compound was surrounded by a fence and they had security cameras. Everyone who left was declared an enemy which reminds me of the Church of Scientology and the Nexium cult. Jerry Irwin once declared that all their churches had doctrines from Satan and misinterpreted the scripture to serve their own agendas. Now moving to the last item, number five. Almost all cult leaders are both narcissistic and paranoid. Jerry and Tiffany do not appear to be an exception to this rule. They were fearful about outside influence and tried to keep the compound secure. They falsely accused people of trying to harm them. Jerry believed that Tiffany was destined for greatness. Starting when Tiffany was young, she was arrogant, condescending, and acted if she had some type of special knowledge that other people did not possess. I think what happened here is that Tiffany was taught from a young age that she was better than other people. She was like a narcissist in training. It's not clear if Tiffany was deliberately lying to the cult members or was delusional, but either way, she positioned herself as the only way people could avoid eternal damnation. As her little empire started to collapse under the weight of her tyranny, Tiffany expressed even more paranoia, grandiosity, and arrogance. She used her power to kill an innocent person in a desperate bid to maintain control and dominance. Tiffany's behavior reveals the dangerousness of inflexible thinking and how far people will go to avoid their worst fears. Tiffany's worst fear was not having power. The cult followers' worst fear was burning in hell. Together, they transformed into what everyone else should fear.
Those are my thoughts on the case of Lucas Leonard and the Word of Life cult. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.